Let's get into today's message. We are going to uh, talk about the book of Hosea today. The book of Hosea today. Uh, let's pray um, and let's dive into uh, this book. Father, we just want to commit uh, ourselves into your hands as we glean through, read through Hosea. I pray that um, your word would just come alive to us. Lord, may your word go forth um, and inspire us. May your word touch us. May our word convict us, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray as we are going through this season of the proposal of Jesus, Lord, you allure us, you capture us, Lord. You help us to see your beauty, to fall in love with you, uh, to just be so caught up with um, your pursuit of us. Lord, help us to see just your love displayed so evidently in the book of Hosea. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, Hosea, the first thing that comes to mind in Hosea last time, when I was reading Hosea, whenever I hear of Hosea, is the story of Hosea and Gomer. And I often thought that the entire book of Hosea is about Hosea and Gomer. But actually, it's only three chapters out of the whole 14 chapters that mentions Hosea and Gomer. And the rest of the story, the rest of the chapters inside Hosea actually reveals God's nature, God's heart so beautifully towards us. But also when I, when I first read through Hosea, I get very confused and I hope to just share a few things for us to uh, help structure our thoughts when we read through Hosea. So when we read through it, we are able to understand what he's talking about. So a quick overview of uh, the book of Hosea. Okay, chapters 1 to 3, uh, I would call it a prequel. So it's a story of Hosea and Gomer, but it very briefly, briefly tells uh, the whole story in Hosea. Chapter 4. 4 to 10, God is calling out Israel's sins and judgment. Right? He calls out their sins and what they have fallen, where they have gone astray, and, and He pronounces and, and tells them and warns them of the judgment that is to come if they are not repentant. In chapter 11, we see God's parental love come out, how He, how he talks to Israel. In chapters 12 to 13, God laments over Israel again. And finally, when we come to chapter 14, we see the fruits of repentance, that He says what will happen when we repent. So this is a brief overview of uh, Hosea and a few things as well. Uh, when we read Hosea, we see that he addresses a few names. Sometimes he calls uh, Israel, then he, call, then he calls Ephraim, then he calls Judah, then he calls Jacob. Who is he talking to? I got very confused uh, until I started to um, break it down and research a bit. So this, the background of Hosea is uh, Israel was divided into two uh, kingdoms, the northern and the southern. Okay, the northern and the southern. The northern is made up of 10 tribes and the southern is made up of two tribes. The northern kingdom, uh, they most commonly refer it to the kingdom of Israel. Okay, Israel. Now the largest tribe in Israel is Ephraim. That's why when, uh, when Hosea calls out Israel or Ephraim, he's referring to the northern part of Israel because that's where he comes from. So he's addressing the northern part of Israel. Sometimes he, you will see that he calls out Jacob, right? Because Jacob is their ancestry. All of the ten tribes come from Jacob. So when he calls out Jacob, he's just calling them out entirely. Sometimes he'll make reference to uh, Judah, right? Because Judah is in the neighboring, the southern kingdom. So the sins of Israel is not isolated to Israel alone, the northern kingdom. Sometimes Judah uh, is af affected, right? So he, he calls out Judah every once in a while. So when we read through Hosea and we see when he calls out uh, Israel or, or, or Ephraim or Jacob, we understand he's addressing the northern kingdom, right? In the history of, of the, uh, them being conquered, them being um, exiled and all that, this point when Hosea is uh, warning them, they are almost at the brink of being exiled or being conquered by Assyria. This is the first exile they're going to have. 
Okay. Uh, after that, you know, last year we talked about Nehemiah and Ezra. That was them coming out from the second, uh, second exile when they were conquered by Babylon. Okay. So this northern kingdom is after uh, northern and southern, and after Solomon, right? Solomon, the reign of Solomon. Then they all got broken up into twelve tribes. 10 to the north, 2 to the south. And now they are coming, uh, they are coming to very close to being uh, conquered by Assyria. So, uh, if I can digress a bit, okay? If I can digress a bit, how do I make sense of which, uh, when they get exiled, when they get conquered and all that, uh, I put it in alphabetical form. A, B, C, D, E, A, F, G. So A is when the Assyrians are going to conquer them. This is after Solomon, right? Solomon split up into northern, southern kingdom. Assyria is going to conquer them. After Assyria conquers them, Babylon is coming, B. After Babylon, what happens? Ezra comes in to rebuild the temple. A, B, C. Where am I now? <laughs> it's E, right? It's e, Ezra. Uh, after Ezra rebuilds and Nehemiah rebuilds all that, right? Then that whole Old Testament part, okay, finish. Then F, finish. <laughs> okay? After F is G. Why G? Because finally God comes in the form of a man. So, very briefly, I mean, this is how I remember, lah, okay? <laughs> I hope it helps. I hope it helps. Okay, when we reach, okay, going back to Hosea, when we read through Hosea again, we oftentimes see God uh, at one moment, He's, he's uh, calling out judgment, right? He's, he's scolding them. Then in the next verse, suddenly, He says, uh, Oh, actually, I want to sayang you. Oh, I love you so much. You know, uh, in chapter 1, right, when, he, when, he, when Hosea and Gomer have their second and third child, God calls them. Uh, tells Hosea to name them No Mercy, Not My People. Literally, the meaning is No Mercy, Not My People. Then in the same chapter towards the end, he says again, I will bring back and I will show them mercy and I'll call them my people. So what is God, what's going through his mind? You know, is he like bipolar or something? Then I understand that when God is speaking to them, he's speaking to them from two different uh, viewpoints, Right? He's speaking to them primarily as a lover, as a bridegroom, and as a parent. Right? A lover and as a parent. So when he brings up the analogy of Hosea and Gomer, and he says that you have committed adultery and all that, he's talking to them as a lover. How they have, in a sense, cheated. Cheated God, committed adultery against God. When he calls them my children, He's, he's talking to them as a form of, of, of a father, a loving father. And we see, his, uh, we see what is going through his heart. Because sometimes as, as, as a parent, right, uh, or as a spouse, we have to bring some very difficult conversations uh, with our significant other. So as a parent, when maybe you see your, your child uh, does something wrong, and you need, to, you need to discipline them, you need to cane them, do you go, wow, today I get to cane my kid? <laughs> we, don't, we don't feel that way. There is this, I need to cane him, but when I cause him pain, you know, I'm going to hurt him. There's this inner struggle in us. And we see God um, expressing that struggle that He has with us, right? or with Israel. We see how He, uh, he, he struggles with disciplining them, with, with bringing judgment, how he actually don't want to and how he's telling them, stop it, stop it, stop it. I don't want to do this to you. We see all of this through Hosea. Interesting. Interesting. Last time I only thought it was just Hosea and Gomer, but then I realized there are more chapters than that. And, and, I, and when I read through it, I'm like, wow, it's so deep. It's so... It reveals God's heart towards us. It reveals God's heart towards us. Okay? So for today's sermon, I want to structure it in, in a few different points. The first uh, section, I want to, to share with us the, the main sins that um, Israel has committed against God. There are three main sins which I, I, I've done my best to compartmentalize them. After the three main sins um, of what they, have, uh, what they have done, we want to see what's the result that they that they. Uh, experience of, of, of sinning and not repenting. 
after that, we want to see Hosea's call for repentance and actually how, are they, how, do they, how do they respond. And finally, we see God's heart for, for His people all this while. There are six chapters out of there uh, that talks about judgment. Actually, all throughout, littered in there, we see God wants to judge, judge, judge. And, and sometimes when we read um, just verse after verse after verse of judgment, we lose sight that that is not His main heart. That is not the first thing that God wants to do. So we see actually how does He treat, how does He view His people. And lastly, we come to um, the fruit of His uh, the fruit of repentance, what he, what he says will happen when his people repent and turn towards him. Okay, so we start off with uh, the first main sin that Israel had commits against God and it's a sin of adultery against God. God likens idolatry to adultery. And sometimes I, I wonder why does he put it so, like why, why does he equate idolatry and adultery? Let's read what the, uh, the verse says, okay? So in Hosea chapter 4, uh, verse 12, he says, My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. In the next verse, they offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills, under oaks, poplars, and therabins, because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. Now, why does he equate idolatry and adultery? And, and I realize he equates it this way because when God views Israel, he views them through covenantal eyes. Covenant. When he views Israel, it's not a contract that he has with them. Sometimes in business contract, right? Uh, if you're not happy with the other party, you can just cancel the contract. Like if you don't like one telco in Singapore, you call them and say, I want to quit. Uh, I want to cancel your telco. This one cannot. God views it as covenant. The covenant of marriage is, is binding. He, he doesn't separate it. You cannot escape from it. It's mutually exclusive. He views them through covenantal uh, love for them. And that's why when they place something higher than God, He views it as them betraying this covenantal love that He has with them. He, in a sense, it's, it's like us saying to our spouse, um, if a husband says to, to his wife, I love you so much, dear, but I also have feelings for my ex. <laughs> Oof. Ooh. Oh, oh, he says, no, I love you. I love you very much. But, but my colleague makes me feel very special. <laughs> and sometimes I go to my colleague to, you know, you don't talk to me that nicely, love. So sometimes I go to my colleague, she talks to me nicely. Oh, that, that, that feels so uncomfortable. That feels a bit gross. <laughs> that feels very wrong. When Israel commits adultery, uh, idolatry against God. That's what they are saying towards Him. Because Israel is not saying, I'm going to leave you. Israel is not saying, I don't want you anymore. Israel is saying, I want you and others. I want you, I want to worship you, I want to give you uh, what I have, but I also want to give that other God what I have. I want to be expressive I want to show my, uh, my effort. I want to put effort into that relationship. That's why he views it, God views it as adultery. Now, in our modern context today, it's a bit more sanitized when we talk about idol worship. Most of the time, uh, we, we, we view it as uh, just going to pray to other idols. In these ancient times, idol worship is not just praying to idols. It involves sacrifice blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices to some gods, baby sacrifices, child sacrifice, child sacrifice um, that they would offer. And beyond that as well, um, some of the 
some of the rituals they have are very sexual in nature. So they would have temple prostitutes, where if a man wants to go and offer and, and seek advice or wants to worship another god, they would go into the temple and they would engage with the prostitutes over there. That's why if we view it from that manner, when God views it from that manner, it's, it's, it's defiling on many different levels. So much so that in, in verse 12, he says, the spirit of harlotry, the spirit of har- harlotry has caused them to stray. All right? There are elements of divination, there are elements of spiritual seduction, sexual rituals uh, made in worshipping other idols. And what's the result of this? The result in, in verse 14. In verse 14, he says, For the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. God is, when, when he sees Israel, uh, committing adultery against him, right? Committing adultery against him. He says, you do not know what you're heading for. You think that you're just asking some, uh, some thing that you have created with your hands to help you. Um, you think you have asked uh, something that is, uh, you've created, you know, man-made stuff to, to, to help you in your, in your crop, in your family, in your thing. He says, you do not know what you are heading for. That's why he says, the people do not understand and will be trampled. Idolatry is, um, is, not, um, is not a terrifying thing right, on the surface. It's not something that is very scary. In, in verse uh, 13, right, in the previous verse, in verse 13, he says, um, they offer sacrifices on mountain tops. They burn incense on hills. Under oaks, poplars, terebins, because their shade is good. Somehow or other, they are, they are drawn by some false sense of goodness that it, that it gives. Similar to us. Today, God doesn't just view idolatry as creating something with our hands, right? A man-made, uh, something man-made, right? Idolatry today is whatever replaces God um, as a center of our lives, whatever replaces Him as most important. And things that replace Him doesn't always have to be bad. It could be good things that replace Him. And yet we are still caught. Uh, trapped away from these good things. What are good things that can replace the love that we have for God? What are good things that can replace the love that we have for God? And when He sees us being uh, fulfilled by those things, when He sees us taking our, uh, being so content with those things, having our desires met by those things, I think He's saying, just be careful. Be careful. Don't let don't be drawn away by the spirit of harlotry. Right? Don't be drawn away by the spirit of harlotry. Sometimes, sometimes ministry can take place, uh, take our place in serving God, or in loving God rather. Sometimes when we have lost that connection with Him, when we have lost that intimacy with Him, and we get so caught up in, in, in the serving, in the doing. Um, we go get so caught up in, in, in all of that and we, we realize and we, sorry, we don't realize that we have missed him completely. There is one, uh, as I was reading through uh, commentaries and all that, this one commentator was saying, sometimes people, they, they, uh, they get disconnected with God, right? They, they lose their relationship with God in, in one place. And so because of that, they go to another church and they realize and they try to find God in that church. 
and they go for a while and, and nothing seems to work and they go from church to church to church to church to church thinking that they can find Him, thinking that by going to church, they can be connected with Him. But missing the fact that all they needed to do was to turn towards Him. To turn towards Him. Right? So the first sin that they, Israel commit was adultery against God. They pursued other people, the, sorry, they pursued other idols, thinking that those other idols would have given them, uh, would give them whatever they need. Now, how did they get so comfortable in this, right? How did they become so comfortable in, in thinking that all that they have uh, achieved, all that they have, all that they have is, is from someone else? Now, this is a point that uh, I realize myself or other people around me often fall into a trap of. The context of, I, of Israel's nation at this point is that they were very successful. They were successful uh, economically, politically, militarily. Militarily. Mili yeah. <laughs> they were successful. They had no lack in uh, the, the king who was overseeing them, King Jeroboam II, managed to establish boundaries, right? They had boundaries in their land. They managed to have good uh, resources. They are not in famine. They are good uh, economically. They are prosperous. They had no lack at this point of time. Somewhere along this goodness, they lost sight of God. They lost sight of God. If you were to read in... Uh, in in the earlier chapters, in chapter 2, right, when, when uh, Gomer was talking to Hosea, or rather when, when they were talking this out, right, Gomer was saying, I will go after my lovers who gave me uh, bread and water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Gomer was saying she would go after her lover who gave her all of these things. Bread and water, her provision, wool and flax, Clothing, her protection, oil and drink, provision, right? Abundance. She thinks that her lover, her adulterous lover, gives her all of these things. But she forgot the main point when in chapter 2, verse 8, when we read, right? That Hosea calls out and says, She did not know it was I who gave her the grain, I who gave her the wine, the oil, and lavished her with silver and gold which they use for Baal. Gomer forgot, and she was the picture of Israel who forgot that in times of uh, prosperity, in times of goodness, she forgot it was God who gave her all of these things. That God brought her through that. And she assumed and she thought that it was the other idols, the other um, man-made stuff that brought her all of these provision. Just like us, when we're in times of, uh, of prosperity. Let's not assume that it was because, of, that it's only because of our hard work, of our smarts, our intellect, that we are at a place uh, of peace. Right? Even now for Petra, as we are coming into out of the uh, more turbulent uh, past few years, as we're going into uh, an, an era of stability, we don't take for granted. Don't pride, don't puff up ourselves. Now the second sin, uh, as we move on, is the sin of relying on ungodly leaders. Relying on ungodly leaders. In chapter 5, uh, verse 1, Hosea says this, Hear this, O priest, take heed, O house of Israel, give ear, O house of the king, for yours is the judgment because you have been a snare to Mizpah and a net spread on Tabor. He calls out the priest, the religious leader. He calls out the house of Israel, the government, right? The house of Israel, the, the, the government. He calls out the king, the ruler, the one in charge of Israel. He says that you have been a snare. Mizpah and Tabor are two mountains in Israel. So he's basically saying you have been a snare to the whole of Israel. You have brought them into, uh, uh, you have stumbled all of them, the whole of Israel. 
All right? He calls them out and he says that you have stumbled them. The leaders stumbled them. All right? They have rendered judgment upon themselves. But what else did they do? In verse 13, um, Hosea says this, When Ephraim, Israel, right, the northern kingdom, saw his sickness, and Judah, the southern kingdom, saw his wound, Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jareb. What did Ephraim and uh, Judah do? When they saw how sick they were, when they saw their depravity, when they saw that they had something uh, wrong with them, what did they do? They turned towards Assyria. They didn't know that Assyria would eventually come and conquer them. But they turned towards another king. Now this king, Jareb, is not mentioned in... Uh, he's not one of the names mentioned as a specific person, but what commentators would say, Jareb means conqueror or warrior. So in a sense, they were turning to a warrior king. They were turning to, uh, to men a stronger man to redeem them, to save them, to help them. When they were confronted, when they realized how sick they were, they didn't turn to God. They turned to men. They turned to someone that was uh, maybe more military, more powerful than them, someone who they feel could, could rescue them, someone maybe with more experience than them. They turned to another man. And Hosea says this, he cannot cure you, nor heal you, of your wound. They turn towards an ungodly leader. It's not even part of Israel. <laughs> they turn to someone else. That's like saying if we have something wrong with our church, we don't go to other Christian leaders, but we turn to other people to solve our problems. Something is wrong. In Paul, in Corinthians, he says, when, when, when he calls out the Corinthian church, he calls out their shame and says, what are you doing? You are supposed, when you judge your own community, you're supposed to look towards your Christian leaders first. Why are you going to, to secular people to solve your Christian problems? All right? They turn to an external help. But, that, but that's not it. I think they tried to do something else a bit better. But we see how they failed a bit more. Okay? In Hosea chapter 8, verse 4, talking about uh, Israel again, they set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, but I did not acknowledge them. They set up kings, but not by me. Princes, but I did not acknowledge them. So now Israel tried to put people up uh, uh, over them again. They tried to put um, kings and princes up. But what was the mistake this time? They didn't seek God. They didn't ask Him, Lord, who would you like um, to put over us? Sounds familiar when, 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 when the people was uh, telling God, God, the, nation, the, the, the surrounding countries, the surrounding nations have a king. Give us a king. At least back then when Saul, King Saul was, was anointed, he went through Samuel. At least that took place. But here Israel, they decided to do their own thing and put kings and princes up uh, above them. They relied on uh, ungodly leaders. We, we see uh, a, a verse that says, the princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. What he's saying, right, when you remove a landmark, is like, is like saying, I would change the boundaries of our land as and when I please. It's actually a, a, a statement of corruption. It's a statement of corruption, right? Um, if I can take this land, I just take. If this land doesn't do well, I, I leave it. You give it to you, right? Maybe they change their boundaries with, the, with, with Assyria, with Egypt. Never mind. You take this land and then you give me some money. But beyond that, the leaders in the country were not just shifting physical boundary lines. By doing all of these things, they were shifting spiritual boundary lines, right? No longer is their religion true and holy, but they have introduced idolatry and false religion that the people are now all led astray. Now, the third major sin 
the third sin that they commit is the rejection, uh, the rejecting of the knowledge of God. The rejecting of the knowledge of God. And this stems from a place of pride. All right? In Hosea chapter 4, uh, verse 1, Hosea says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Hosea judges them. He tells them um, in Israel that there is no truth or knowledge of God in the land. Somehow or rather, after uh, David and after Solomon and after all of that, they, they have come to a place where there is no knowledge of God. The people don't know God. Their responsibility, uh, by the way, relies uh, on the leaders of the land, <laughs> the priests, the leaders, the kings, that they have all led them astray. They have all led them astray, right? In verse 4, now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Th therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophet shall also, also shall stumble with you in the night. He says this and he, he, uh, he explains a bit more. He says, um, your people are like those who contend with the priest. Contend means they're always arguing, right? They, they don't listen. They like to argue just for the sake of arguing. And... He's saying that the people like to argue with the priest. Now the priest, one of the functions of the priest is to, um, to, to help and to lead and to teach the word of God. In Deuteronomy, uh, they're supposed to teach the word of, of God. But somehow Israel, the, the people have come to a place where they wouldn't submit to the priest. They wouldn't allow them to lead. Instead, they find themselves always arguing against the priest. Right? And it's so bad that in verse 5 it says, you shall stumble in the day. It's okay to stumble at night. But when it comes to the day, when you can see things clearly, Hosea is saying, you are stumbling in the day. The prophet shall also stumble with you. The people are so um, contentious, are so uh, argumentative. They don't want to listen so much so that the prophet who is supposed to um, call people back to God, ends up stumbling. Ends up stumbling. Now what's the result? Right? Of the priest and the people rejecting the knowledge of God. It's found in verse 6. And we are familiar with this verse. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. He begins verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, because of their sin of rejecting the knowledge of God, of rejecting Him, they, they have set themselves up on a path to be destroyed. All right? What's the result of all of this? Actually, we see peppered throughout uh, Hosea is, uh, is uh, are verses like, they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall, uh, they shall sow, but they will never reap. The result of them uh, being in sin all the time, of rejecting God, is fruitlessness. Fruitlessness. No matter what they do, they cannot bear fruit. No matter what they try to uh, fulfill themselves with, they are never satisfied. They find themselves at a place of no provision. It got me thinking for a bit, like, how do I know? How do I know if I am, like, out of God's way already? <laughs> and, uh, you know, if I'm, like, straying out of, uh, of His will. And I, and I see, when I read Hosea, I realize this fruitlessness. I'm never satisfied. I'm never fulfilled. No matter what I do, it's not productive. It's not fruitful. 
somehow I've entered into a season of, of no provision at all. I think if this is happening to us, then we should just maybe pay a bit more attention. Is, is something off in my life? Is something off in my life? Okay? Now we come to uh, uh, the beginning of the hopeful part. Right? You'll dip a bit more, <laughs> but it's the beginning of a hopeful part. Hosea calls for repentance. Right? We see a call for repentance. In Hosea chapter 6, he says this, Come and let us return to the Lord, for He has torn, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us up that we might live in His sight. Any of this sound familiar? Sounds a bit familiar, right? Yeah. When Hosea calls for repentance, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't disregard that um, that they are going through discipline, that God will discipline them. He will, because they have sinned, right? Just because you have, just because you have uh, said sorry doesn't mean you don't get uh, discipline. But here what Hosea is saying, firstly, he says, come, let us return to him. He says he has torn, but he will heal. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. He's saying that when God disciplines you, it's going to feel painful. It's going to feel uh, uneasy. It's not going to feel good. But the hope is this. He will heal you. He will bind you. He will restore you. He will redeem you. He will revive you. He will raise you up. So that the end is you may live in His sight. You may live in His sight. Discipline is necessary in his heart. Discipline from God is necessary in his heart, but we cannot mix it up with judgment. Right? Sometimes we think that when he deals us a hard hand, we think it's God judging, judging us. We think it's God um, yeah, judging us. But judgment actually looks different. How do we know when God judges us? It's not when he gives us hard times, right? So one example of how he gives us, uh, how he disciplines us in, is in Hosea chapter 2 when, uh, when Gomer is talking, right? She says, uh, sorry, in, in, in chapter 1, he says, he hedges our paths and we can't find our path. He hedges our path. That means along the path that we are traveling on, he puts like thorn, thorns and thistles, hedges along the path so that when we try to, when we go off course, oh, it pricks us. It's uncomfortable, so we stay on, on course, right? That is, is discipline when he is like, you know, pep us a bit. Judgment comes, judgment looks like him removing his hand from us. And he does it. In Romans chapter 1, he, he talks about it. He says, for they, have, they are so sinful that I've given them over to their lust. I've given them over to their depraved self. The judgment of God isn't, uh, isn't, or rather the discipline of God isn't us going through hard time. It isn't Him bringing us through seasons of wilderness because He's there with us. The judgment of God is when He removes Himself completely from us. Right? Here, He calls them to repentance. He calls them to repentance, but we see uh, Israel's heart Hosea is saying, come, come because I will heal you, I will bind you up, I will revive you, I will raise you up. Come and repent. And we see Israel's response in verse 4. All right, in chapter 6, verse 4. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? Both the north and south. For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goes away. Your faithfulness is like the mist in the morning. You say, I'm sorry, but the next moment you turn and you go back continuing on your own way. You say, it's gone. <laughs> it's not there. In a sense, God is saying your repentance is false. It comes and goes as quickly as the morning mist. It comes and goes so quickly. But this is where uh, Israel has is so steeped in their sin 
in their lack of knowledge for God, that they think that they are still on the right track. <laughs> what they would do is, um, is that in their idolatry against God, right, they would bring to God still sacrifices for sin. They would bring to God still sacrifices for, um, uh, for, for, for cleansing. And they think that just by bringing to God the constant sacrifices that God will overlook their sin. They think that by following the ritual practices, um, that their sins are forgiven. They think that by following and, and doing the, um, the animal sacrifices and all of those things, they think that by doing that, they have put themselves right before God. But God says, no, you just sacrifice and the next thing you know, you're out um, committing adultery with, with other idols. He says, you have missed the point. Your works, your, your sacrifices, you have missed the point completely. That's not what I'm after. And he says this in verse 6, one of the most famous verses that, that we hear of. He says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. He says, you can bring your burnt offerings. You, can, you, you think that by doing it, that I'm pleased with you. You think that just following the, the letter of the law of, of what is uh, appropriate or what is the culture of your time, you think that by doing all of these things that you have restored my relationship with you. But he says, no, I desire mercy. Now this Hebrew word is chesed. Chesed. Chesed means, one word cannot encapsulate what the Hebrew word means, but it means God's covenantal loving kindness, His goodness, His mercy, His love shown towards His people, His covenantal um, love. He desires that covenantal love uh, that, uh, that He has with His people. He, he desires that covenantal faithfulness. And He says, I desire for you to be faithful to me, to step into this covenant with me more than sacrifices. It's again, it's like the Christian who busies, busies himself or herself with ministry and with serving and with leading and with tithing and all of those things, everything under the sun. But, but if he missed the point of saying, Lord, I want to, I just want to, I just want to, I just want to love you. I want to be in love with you. Is the Christian who has maybe fallen away and think that by uh, volunteering, by leading, by, by serving more, the Christian thinks that by doing all of these things, somehow they're in a right relationship with God. But God is saying, you have missed it. Because I desire chesed. I desire this relationship with you. Come and turn your face towards me. Turn your face towards me. And like that, that lyric, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory, yes. his face turned towards him. Israel didn't turn towards him, and as a result, they were eventually conquered by Assyria. As a result, they were conquered by Assyria. They missed it completely. But here is God's heart for His people. Here is His heart for His people. We, we go through Hosea seeing the judgment that He has, the punishment that He has, how He calls out the sin, the sins of His people. right? But we need to understand His heart. And there are two chapters. There are two chapters in Hosea that, that describe so beautifully His heart. The first one is in chapter 2. The second half of chapter 2 in verse 14. 
Hosea says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and I'll bring her back into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. Now, just before this, uh, just before this in Hosea chapter 2, right, he calls out, he calls out all of Hosea's sins. He's, he's saying to them uh, how, he, how she has chased after uh, idols, how, how he will expose her, how he will not have mercy on, 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 on her, how he will remove everything, uh, how he will take away everything from within her because of her idolatry, because of her adulterous nature. But come verse um, verse 14, suddenly Hosea switches, suddenly God switches. And he says, even though you have done all of these sins, even though you have been, uh, in a sense, naked before the world, in a sense, how you have been adulterous, how you have been so sinful, this is what he will do to them. I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. What does allure mean? What does allure mean? It, it gives a sense of, of, uh, of wooing, of tenderness, of whispering sweet nothings, of, of pursuing, of drawing. Suddenly, God's tone changes and it's not one of, of calling out His judgment, but it's one of, of uh, hey, He's speaking to her as a lover of wooing her. I will allure you and I'll bring you back into the wilderness. And what does he do there? He speaks comfort to her. He assures her. Now this is very interesting. Why wilderness? And we'll go through it later, right? In verse 15, he says this, I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor, a door of hope. I will give her vineyards from there in the wilderness and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. See, in the wilderness, he doesn't just abandon her. He provides for her. The valley of Achor was a place where uh, God was judging uh, Israel. So what happened was um, Joshua was out uh, fighting battles. And there was one battle he didn't win because someone from the camp kept some spoils. All right, they kept spoils from the war and God said, don't keep anything. Everything, just give it to him. Don't keep anything. And this family kept it. And as a result, they lost the war. So what happened is the whole of Israel brought him that, and his whole family to the valley of Achor and they stoned him there because they caused him trouble. Now, what does he say? Hosea says, in the valley of Achor, I'll give you a door of hope. He turns the place where we are most troubled, where it's our lowest area. He turns the place where we have sinned, where we have uh, stumbled, and that he turns it into a place of hope. He turns it into a door of hope. Hosea says, she, she, sh she shall sing there. <laughs> Luckily not selling seashells there. <laughs> She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. What happened when they came up from the land of Egypt? God led them into the wilderness where He, sh where he showed them, um, where He led them, He provided for them, where He nurtured them, He gave them food. When none of their clothes ever uh, tore, He treated them like, um, like His own son, like His own daughter, like... like, like uh, like toddlers, right? He took care of them. And he's saying that I want to take care of you um, just like in those days, in the, in the sense, the good old days. Do you know when he says that he will turn the valley of Achor as a door of hope? How does that apply to us today? If we read um, John, there were seven I am's that Jesus says. And one of it, he says, I am the door. I am the door. Today, our hope is if we are in this valley of Achor, if we are in this valley of Achor where we are stuck in sin, if we find it hard to repent, if we are, if we are 
just trapped there. He says, turn to Jesus, for I am the door. I am the door that will. Um, he says, all who come before me, sorry, anyone who enters by me, he will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Jesus today is the door that we walk through and he's inviting us. He's inviting us, say, come walk through me, walk to me, and I will bring you, I will allure you into the, the, I will allure you out into the secret place, into the secret place. He speaks as, as a lover, uh, as a lover, and he wants to, to bring us into that place of intimacy. This is how God views us, um, this is how God views us, as seen in Hosea. The next thing... Mm. Mm. In chapter 11, verse 1, how does God view, him, view us again? When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. But they did not know I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Here, God reveals himself more uh, as, a, as a father figure. He says, when, when uh, Israel was a child, I loved him. I taught Ephraim to walk. I took them by his arms. Uh, in the, he says... Um, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. I stooped and fed them. Hosea is given a picture of God as a father stooping down and feeding his child. It's a, it's a picture of, we see in the New Testament, as Jesus the servant who came down to minister to us as Jesus was the picture of the Father coming down to minister to His children, to heal His children, to show kindness, to show mercy to His children. We see the heart of, uh, we see the, heart of, uh, of the Father again. He's going to discipline His children, but we see how His heart is truly like. In verse 8, he says this, How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I give you up? How can I hand you over? He says, Assyria is coming. Assyria is going to conquer you if you're unrepentant. And if you're unrepentant, I need to discipline you. But how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboilim? Adma and Zeboilim are... Uh, cities that were close to Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah. <laughs> so I keep making that. Never mind. Right? So when God destroyed those two cities, these are two peripheral cities that got destroyed along as well. He says, how can I hand you over? He says, my heart turns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. He continues in verse 9. In verse 9, he says, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. Here is a picture of him saying, you lot have sinned. I cannot bear to, I cannot bear to wipe all of you out. I will still save a remnant. A remnant I will keep. I will keep a remnant. He needs to do it, but it's painful for him to do it. He needs to do it because it's for our own good. Because we have set ourselves up to be disciplined by him. He calls to be re for, for repentance. He calls for it, but, but because they were unrepentant, he says, if you, I cannot, I cannot, I need to do it. All right. Maybe it's like the parent who, who has to send his kid to be caned by the discipline master. Or the parent who needs to, uh, 
or the parent who needs to call and report his son for, for, for drug abuse. Because if you, don't, if you don't stop that, you will destroy yourself. It's the parent who has to call up the police and, and knowing that this guy, when he goes to jail, he's going to get, he's going to get whipped on his... He's going to get whipped. His heart aches. And when we reach it, we see oh, God is not a God who is quick to just pour out His judgment. He is a lover who is heartbroken when, when we sin. He is a lover who is heartbroken when we, when we turn to other people to, to satisfy us. He is a father who is heartbroken when, his, when he sees his children mm, being unrepentant. He's heartbroken and he doesn't want to do all of these things. Can I get uh, the band up, please, as I just want to close the, uh, the message. Lastly, we see what happens if we repent. The fruits of repentance. He's saying that um, if you were to do all of those things, but if you repent, this is what you will get from, you will get from repentance. In verse 14, is the last chapter of Hosea. He says this, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel, and he shall grow like the lily and... Sorry, let's read that again. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. And they shall revive like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. He says here... When you repent, when we come back before Him, when He says uh, He will grow like the, the lily, growth will happen to us. He will grow us. He will, when He says beauty, in verse uh, 6, Sorry, in verse 5, he says when he grow like the lily, he's, he talks about growth and beauty that is being restored. When he talks about strength, when he talks about lengthening the roots like Lebanon, strength is restored. And he says his beauty is like an olive tree. Your value is restored. When he says your fragrance is like Lebanon, your delight is restored. When he says you are revived like the green, you will grow like the vine, your scent shall be like the, the wine of Lebanon, your abundance is restored. When he says his branch, your branch shall spread, he says you will be a blessing to the people around you. You will be a blessing to the people around you. Mm. In Hosea chapter 2, uh, and we go to verse 14 again. Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. When it says, Therefore I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. I will speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there and from the valley of Echor, a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth as in the days when she came out from Egypt. Do you know what is the result of God alluring us? What is the result of Him bringing us back to the wilderness where He speaks tenderly, gently, where He turns, when He turns the valley of Achor into a door of hope? Do you know what is the result of us walking to Jesus who says, I am the door, who says, uh, when you come in, I'll lead you to pastures. Do you know what's the result of us encountering Him? In verse 16, in Hosea chapter 2, after this verse, he says this, And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, 
that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. In that day when you are when we are drawn back to him, when he leads us, he says, you'll be so overwhelmed, you'll be so convinced, you'll be so, you'll feel so pursued of my love for you that you will call me my husband. It is the bridegroom paradigm that we will see him as a groom, as someone in covenantal relationship. We'll see him as someone who says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. I vow to be with you. And on earth we say, to death do us part. Jesus will say, death will not keep us apart. I vow to be with you. I will pursue you. We won't call him master. We are no longer his servants. But we will call him our husband. We will be so in love with him that even in verse 17, he says this, For I will take from her mouth the names of Baals and they shall remember by their name no more. We will forget everything else that gave us any form of contentment or desire or pleasure. And we can understand when the, when the lyric says, and the things of the world will go strangely dim when we look upon His face. And this is His promise to us. When, we, when He says, I will bring you, I will bring you into the desert. I will allure you. I will, I will captivate you. That is His promise towards us. Shall we stand? So the call for us here today, right? Uh, the call for us here, for us here today. What is our from knowing to being? <laughs> right? If we read Hosea, what is the knowing to being that we want to step into? Hosea reveals two things of God that I feel can be our knowing to being. The first one, we now know He views us as His bride, that He is our bridegroom, He is our husband. So the call is for us to be His faithful bride. The call for us is to be His faithful bride. This year, do we want to be empowered by His Spirit to be faithful to Him? Do we want to be washed by His Word. In Ephesians 5, He calls husbands wash your, uh, to purify your wife by the washing of the Word. So when we read the Word, He as our husband purifies us as His bride. Do we want to be empowered by the Spirit to say true to the groom, to the one who calls us out? Who like in songs, on, songs of song, leaves the, uh, uh, the oil on the on the door like songs of song he says my beloved my sister my beautiful wife who calls out do you want to respond to him in that way that's number one do we want to be do we want to be his faithful bride and number two maybe some of us might need to come to him as a father as a child unafraid of his father when he says things like, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I how can I how can I hand you over, O Israel? When he says, I taught Ephraim to walk. Maybe for us here, when Hosea reveals God not as a distant God who wants to judge, but as a God, as a loving father who wants to draw us to him. Maybe for, for some of us, it's to come to Him, to be that child before Him. To remember this God is not a terrifying God, but is a God whose heart aches, who, who, who is someone who, who, who says His heart churns within Him, whose sympathy is stirred. So as the worship team leads us in, uh, in a time of worship, uh, I would just like to give space for the Spirit to minister to us, to let the Spirit reveal to us 
And even as we read through Hosea, how he longs and how he calls for us, 